Uh, I'm really excited to be here today um, and be in conversation with so many great thinkers. Um, this is my first Zoom talk like this, uh, so I'm pretty excited. Um, I'm grateful for everybody that's tuning in. It's a little weird speaking into the void, but um, I know you're all there, so I appreciate everyone's interest, engagement, um, and support for all the great work that is happening here. Uh, I want to start my presentation with a poem from my friend, classmate, uh, comrade Zuri Armand. Um, I sent him a paper who a paper which um, composes part of this talk. Um, and as he was reading it, he immediately uh, wrote this poem um, in response to the paper. And I think it represents the kind of thought relationship that we've developed and Honestly, much of this talk is owed to that relationship that we've had together and some of these uh, thinking through these concepts. Um, so I'll start with the poem, The Line for Jennifer Lara. Nothing but rivers tinted red, like libations or crust, brick erupting, deferred dreams, pipe dreams, wielded as Garrett, last breath, first breath, empty of articulation. So today my talk will be focusing on the concept of structural adjustment. By assessing this concept on a recorded public talk, I'm reluctantly placing myself within the sphere of the Afro-pessimism debates, but here we are. Within these debates, I've rarely seen an assessment of uh, Frank Wilderson's use of structural adjustment. Though I see it as a critical term for understanding what I find most useful about what I see Afro-pessimism attempting to do, which is create space for revolution, Black revolutionary thought and desire. At a recent talk on Afro-pessimism earlier this week, Professor Horton Spillers posed the following question. What, what is the usefulness of heuristically understanding oneself as a slave. I argue that an analysis of structural adjustment can provide a productive answer to this question, and maybe more importantly, provoke the inverse question. What is at stake in not heuristically understanding oneself as a slave? To address these questions, I find it useful to engage Afro-pessimism alongside the work of the political prisoner and theorist, George Jackson. Jackson's writings illuminate, clarify, and extend Afro-pessimism. While Wilderson is focused on thinking at the level of Black political desire, George Jackson helps us think about the relationship between desire, strategy, and organization. In Blood in My Eye, George Jackson writes, quote, as a slave, the social phenomenon that engages my whole consciousness is, of course, revolution. The slave and revolution. Frank Wilderson offers a re resonant claim in his recent text, Afro Pessimism. Social death can be destroyed, but the first step towards the destruction is to assume one's position as a slave, and then in parentheses, assume not celebrate or disavow, and then burn the ship of the plantation in its past and present incarnations from the inside out. Jackson and Wilderson each arrive at the link between the slave and revolution through an, an analysis of blackness as a paradynamic structural position rather than a cultural identity that is inaugurated and elaborated through slavery. For both of these thinkers, slavery is not a temporal condition. It is a relational dynamic between social death and social life that has not been disrupted by the abolition of chattel slavery, the institution of civil rights, or constitutional decolonization. There are no temporal or spatial limits to anti-Black violence, even when accounting for historically varying instances of anti-Blackness there is no black time that precedes or succeeds the time of the slave. The structural position of blackness as slaveness places the black outside of the discourses of civil society 
and the Black subjection to gratuitous violence and perpetual captivity enable civil society's existence and coherence. The Black does not have access to the language of rights, entitlements, legitimate arrival, or sovereignty, the language of humans, the language of reform. Cannot seek to reconfigure civil, civil society, it must destroy it. And quoting Wilderson here, civil society itself, rather than its abuses or its shortcomings, is a state of, emer is a state of emergency for the Black. Wilderson argues in the acknowledgments to red, white, and Black that a, quote, unflinching paradigmatic analysis is essential to a movement dedicated to the complete overthrow of an existing order. Citing the compromises of the Charterist movement in South Africa, he argues that, again, quote, our inability or unwillingness to hold the moderate's feet to the fire of a political agenda predicated on an unflinching paradigmatic analysis allowed our energies and points of attention to be displaced by to pragmatic considerations. So if afro as slaveness, structural adjustment refers to black politics. Ooh. So is my connection working? Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna just keep going. Um, I'll start the sentence over. If Afro-pessimism is arguing for an unflinching black politics that is rooted in an understanding of the structural position of blackness as slaveness, structural adjustment refers to black politics that disavow this position of blackness as slaveness and attempt to move as if the black has the structural capacity of humans. Structural adjustment forces slash invites the black to believe that its condition does have analogs and forces invites the black to speak in the language of rights, entitlements, inclusion and access and move to the tactics of a petition and appeal to the state, reformism and compromise. Black political desire is routinely structurally adjusted away from embracing the destruction of civil society and toward attempts to reform it. This process is enacted at the level of state practices and within radical social movements. This is why Afro-pessimism spends considerable time critiquing multiracial coalition politics as they often work to delimit and crowd out the demands and aspirations of the Black. So Wilderson introduces the concept of structural adjustment in the introduction to Red, White, and Black as he's describing the political landscape Afro-pessimism is intervening in. Wilderson argues that in the 1960s and 70s, that the, the 1960s and 70s were a period in which revolutionaries had considerable power to pose the question of the destruction of US civil society. Jerry Sexton argues that following this period, the US state has subjected Black thought to, quote, large scale domestic structural adjustments. The intense level of state repression of black movements in the 70s and 80s led to the death, political incarceration or exile of black revolutionaries taking up confrontational postures against the state. The ascendance of a neo-colonial black, black political leadership class, a process Dylan Rodriguez refers to as multicultural white supremacy has saturated black politics with ideas of representation, electoralism, and reform. The openness made by integration have created a growing black middle class, which have given numbers of black folks access to borrowed institutionality through which they can distance themselves from the position of the slave. These historical processes have contributed to the adjustment of black politics towards reformism. This period of domestic structural adjustment coincides with the international project of the imposition of structural adjustment policies and programs on African states. Wooderson attends to this link, stating that structural adjustment at the level of political desire and analysis is, quote, not unlike the structural adjustment debtor nations must adhere to for the privilege of securing a loan. This relationship illuminates what Zakia Iman Jackson calls the burden of inclusion into a racially hierarchicized university, universal, sorry, universal humanity. The extension of human recognition of incorporation is a violent process in which inclusion and abjection go hand in hand. The violence of humanization and incorporation 
of the black into the US and the black state into the international market requires an adjustment of politics. To stretch Wilderson with George Jackson, this international analysis reveals the significance of stifling the development of black socialism, communalism, and the development of black politics in the adjustment of black politics towards reformism. To quote Jackson directly, the African societies which allow capitalism to remain are still neo-colonies, slave states, dominated by westernized black right-wing puppets. I argue that the destruction of civil society that the slave embodies involves black communization, total abolition. This international reading of structural adjustment also reveals at the level of US civil society, the adjustment of black politics away from revolution and towards an investment in US citizenship is critical for the stability of US imperialism. So now moving to my last section. How then should we think about an unadjusted black politics, developing it and its contents? I wanna to return to George Jackson to think through this question. Jackson provides resources for thinking about refusing structural adjustment and developing an unadjusted politics in his writings in Soledad Brother. Jackson theorizes the condition of blackness as slaveness and is brought to a more acute awareness of this condition through his experiences of incarceration. Slavery is not confined to his incarceration, yet it is incarceration and especially the removal of the prospect of parole, which I see as the loss of the capacity for structural adjustment, which enables him to see the relations of blackness and slaveness more clearly. In Wilderson's essay, The Prison Slave as Hegemony Silent Scandal, Wilderson distinguishes between the black prison slave and prison slave in waiting. These figures occupy the same structural position with the only difference being whether one is currently in prison. Thinking Jackson and Wilderson together, structural adjustment forces invites prison slaves in waiting to see themselves as temporally and spatially distant from those who are already captive. For Jackson, acknowledging blackness as a state of captivity was key for posturing himself towards revolutionary activity. He states, quote, as soon as all of this became clear to me and I developed the nerve to admit it to myself that we were defeated in war and are now captives, slaves, or actually that we inherited a neo-slave in existence, I immediately became relaxed, always expecting the worst and started working on the remedy. George James and Frank Wilderson both have argued that contemporary abolition politics has distanced itself from the thought and praxis of the captive. George James specifically has argued that in the shift from what she calls the revolutionary to the reactionary period, academic and nonprofit directed abolitionism has overdetermined abolitionist thought, moving it away from revolutionary struggle and presenting abolition as achievable through incremental non-reformist reforms. The ascendancy of defund the police and other state mediated pathways toward abolition as the frameworks through which abolition has been articulated in the aftermath of last summer's uprisings is evidence of this process. The popularization of a procedural approach to abolition relies on an assumption that the carceral state will wither away, obscuring the ways in which the state will hold onto its foundational relations of carceral violence. It engages the state as if the black is in a clientelist relationship with the state rather than an adversary. Procedural abolition is structural adjust, structurally adjusted. It delays revolutionary preparation. To cite George Jackson, with each reform, revolution became more remote. It acquiesces to the state's preference to redirect black insurgency into reformism rather than total abolition. Again, quoting Jackson, reformism was allowed. Refusing adjustment and thinking through the position of the slave reminds us that the black is not in community with the state. Quoting Jackson again, the enemy is aware, determined, disguised, totalitarian and mercilessly counter-revolutionary. The position of the slave argues, again to quote George Jackson, fascism has temporarily succeeded under the guise of reform. The only way we can destroy it is to refuse to compromise with the enemy state and its ruling class. So I'll close with one more long quotation of George Jackson from Blood in My Eye that I think gets at the urgency of what I'm attempting to argue here. 
to the slave, <clears throat> sorry, to the slave, revolution is an imperative, a love inspired, conscious act of desperation. It's aggressive. It isn't cool or cautious. It's bold, audacious, violent, an expression of icy, disdainful hatred. It can hardly be any other way without raising a fundamental contradiction. If revolution, and especially revolution in America, is anything less than an effective defense attack weapon and a charger for the people to mount now, it is meaningless to the great majority of the slaves. If revolution is tied to dependence on the inscrutabilities of long range politics, it cannot be made relevant to the person who expects to die tomorrow. There can be no rigid time controls attached to the process that offers itself as relief, not if for those whom is principally intended are under attack now. Thank you. <laughs>